Hello, welcome to Islamic Civilization Session 14. This time talking about the Caliphate, what happened in Islamic history and to the Muslims in Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. So this Session 14 deals with a new concept of government called the Caliphate. But before we reach there, we need to get through the circumstances arising uh, from the death of the Prophet and a little bit before what happened before the death of the Prophet. So let's see what we have in terms of the objective in session 14. Muslims face challenges soon after the death of their Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. They had to select or elect a leader that was called Caliph and started a new style of governance that we refer to as Caliphate. So Caliphate is the governance that Muslims started after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. So the first Caliph was Abu Bakr, the first ruler, uh, religious or political ruler of the Muslims was Abu Bakr who ruled between 632 soon after the death of the Prophet to 634. He did not rule for long, only two years, and you will see why he ruled for two years only. Okay. Then uh, what he did, uh, how he defeated invasions, and how he protected the ideology of Islam. So how he protected Muslims and protected Islam, that we would also see this was the most turbulent time in the history of Islam soon after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So very critical time for Islam as well as Muslims. And so that's why this session 14 is important in the sense that this is, go this is going to set the trend for the, uh, you know, at least um, the next uh, 500 years, so to speak. And Caliphate would continue, you know, the new system that was established and some of the dangers that uh, Muslims as well as their religion Islam faced at the hands of the Arabs and non-Arabs. So let's see what happened soon after the death of the Prophet. The challenges arising from the death of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, the death of the Messenger, the nature of the Prophet, he was born and he died like any human being. So he was a human being, did not, he was not a divine being according to Islam. And never, Muslim never, you know, would never accept any human being as divine. So divine is only God. And that is the basic mainstay of Islam called monotheism or Tawheed. Okay. Uh, he set the highest uh, standard the human example of monotheism, which is a sincere belief and worship of one God whose Arabic name is Allah. And he also set the highest standard for human morality, morals or human conduct, the best relation that he had with people and that till this day is being used as you know, the standard for Muslims that this is how they should behave with fellow human beings, with one another at home, in the community, and at large. Okay, let's see. Still staying with the death of the messenger. Muhammad, peace be upon him, his last sermon at Mount Arafat during Hajj in 632 AD. This was, you know, the last Hajj and the only Hajj that he performed. And there, as you see, you know, the, the pillar that you see there 
in the picture, that is supposed to be the place where he stood. And all the people, you know, 10,000 or more, uh, gather around him to listen to him and let's see what he told them in a nutshell. I think we dealt with this, uh, you know, before in the previous sessions. So let's see what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, said in his last sermon. He told people very clearly that there is going to be no messenger or prophet after me. Reason well. La Nabi Abadi, there is no messenger coming after me, so you should, you know, reason well among yourselves. Do not follow Satan. Do not go astray here or there. Just stray, stay on the right path, which is Suratul Mustaqim. The next, I mean, another name for Islam, Suratul Mustaqim, means the straight path. Do not go here and there, east or west. Just follow Islam, the straight path of Islam. Do not practice racial superiority. Think about it. This was 632 AD. And there he tells Muslim, beware of racial superiority. He very clearly, I, I really, you know, I, I, you know, you tell me if there is any example, okay, of anyone telling in such clear cut terms to his people. As early as 632 AD, telling people there is no superiority of a white man over a black man, nor there is any superiority of a black man over a white man. There is no superiority of an Arab over non-Arab, and there is no superiority of race or ethnicity of a non-Arab over the Arabs. So he told them in very clear terms that there is no racial or ethnic superiority in Islam, everybody is born out of the same family of Adam and Eve. God created us from one family, Adam and Eve. We are all children of Adam and Eve. And we are one humanity. Simple as that. And God turned us into tribes and nations, not to hate each other, but to know each other. So the tribal aspect of the human being or the ethnicity or the language or nationality or regionality, the region or race, these are to identify ourselves, not to hate each other, uh, one another. And so that, the, I mean, you really cannot get clear on this point, a clearer, you know, instruction on this uh, racial superiority or inferiority, you know, as early as 632, and the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, emphasized, and not just only in this sermon, but, you know, throughout his life, he was very much against racial superiority or inferiority. In fact, he asked a freed black slave by name Bilal, to be the first Mu'azzan of Islam. Mu'azzan is the person who calls people to prayer five times a day, you know, and you hear over the loudspeakers and, uh, you know, everywhere in the Muslim countries, the, the call to the prayer called the Azan. So that honor he gave to a black, free, freed slaves. And so people, some people thinking, you know, he cannot even speak Arabic with a clear accent. And he said, doesn't matter, you know, he would do this job and he did it and ever since that is, uh, and I really, you cannot think of Islam without, you know, Africans and they're, because they're so close to, you know, Mecca and Medina and Saudi Arabia and a lot of, you know, in, um, I mean, Africa people are Muslims and so there is no racial superiority in Islam and that, you know, God is very clear in the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu is very clear in his Aziz, Hadith and his Sunnah in his practice. In fact, some scholars tell us, some scholars of Islam, that racial super, practicing racial superiority is sin in Islam. And also, if any human being thinks that he or she is inferior to somebody else, that is also a sin. And I'm going to leave it now at that because we need to move forward in this uh, session 14. So staying with the message, your wives are trust from God. 
that's another you know very powerful message that he gave uh, to people to muslims at that time practice the quran and sunnah my you know uh, my traditions so he said practice the quran and sunnah the, the the book of god the divine book quran the holy book of islam and my sunnah my tradition my practice okay. so this is what the prophet left to muslims the quran as you see it on the left and hadith or sunnah as you see it on the right okay these are the two major sources for muslims and islamic law to practice now the death of the messenger muslim faced a lot of problems and some of them were they had to select or elect a leader uh, and this was a, you know very complicated business and they had to face the rise of false prophets soon after the death of the prophet you see these prophets popping up left and right and people claiming oh i'm the new prophet now and i'm the new prophet and some of them even fighting and one woman she went and married a, another false prophet he said well, you are prophet i am a prophetess so let's marry and join hands together against muslims and that also happened apostasy or rejection of islam and some people just you know they were muslim when the prophet died say forget it you know we are out of it and so they left islam and some would say well, we we are not going to uh, follow islam completely we are going to do only certain things and not all the five pillars so maybe we can do the first pillar which is the shahada we just say we are muslim we believe in one god and we believe that the muhammad is the prophet of you know god and that's it we would not pray and some say no we can pray you know we can do the first pillar the second pillar but we we are not going to fast some say no okay we will fast also but we would not pay charity to the poor people and so this was like a, you know picking their cherries in islam and that was not acceptable uh, and so they had to be you know brought back to the islamic fold in fact a lot of uh, these people who adopted this type of a behavior rejecting islam they believed that islam was muhammad and muhammad was islam and he told them no that's not the case islam is god you know i told you just i gave you the way to reach that god so islam is the order the commandment of god and i gave you the way i showed you the way how to fulfill those commandments and so that that was another huge big problem you know arising soon after the death of islam okay let's see what else rebellion of bedouin and other tribes that that you know that was the nature of bedouins they would whenever they would see an opportunity to raid someone they would do that so attack so these revolts and rebellions of bedouins and other tribes that that was also a big problem for you know the muslim community that was left without the messenger without a leader so the protection of islamic doctrines and practices very important and that had to be you know um, achieved and now you know so the selection or election of the caliph who was going to be a successor to the prophet so selection or election of a leader caliph who was going to be a successor to the prophet not to succeed him as a prophet or as a messenger of god no that was for sure not going to be but he was going to be the political leader as well as the religious leader of the muslims after the death of the prophet so let's see how that happened the selection or election of a caliph muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace be upon him did not nominate anyone he left the decision to his followers to decide for themselves who they wanted as their leader after his death muslims leaders at that time they they had to select or elect someone and that someone that leader was going to be called khalifa that is the arabic and the english side's form is caliph so khilafa or caliphate so he was going to be the successor to the prophet not as a messenger keep that in mind not as a prophet but as the leader of the muslim community and his rule the caliph rule is called caliphate or khilafa caliphate 
is the rule by the caliphs. After the Prophet Muslim selected or elected the first four caliphs, whose combined uh, period is from 632 to 661 AD, you know, uh, less than, um, I mean, 30 years, uh, the four leaders, the first four caliphs ruled uh, after the death of the prophets, of the prophet. And so these first four leaders or caliphs are called Khulafaul Rashidin, the rightly guided caliphs. So there is a title for the first four leaders, first four caliphs, Khulafaul Rashidin, the rightly guided caliphs. They were guided by the Quran and Sunnah. That's what they call the rightly guided because they followed the Quran and Sunnah. And if anybody, you know, follow Quran and Sunnah, they would be, you know, rightly guided, whether caliph or not. But these caliphs, the, you know, none of them, neither a pope nor a prince, okay, that is uh, not in Islam. However, they look like and work like priestly politicians, very humble people. So they were very religious people, but at the same time they were politicians in the sense that they had to take care of the political aspect and the religious aspect of Islam. Okay? So they were also commander of the faithful in the military sense. So as you see from uh, this sort of a description of the caliph, he is a political leader. He is also a religious leader. And he is also a military leader. Even though, you know, they may not go all, the, you know, all out and fight as the Prophet did, you know, along with the Muslims against the enemies of Islam, they can sit behind and send their troops, and that's what they did. That's what all commander-in-chiefs, you know, everywhere uh, in the world they do. And so not everybody is Alexander the Great to go, you know, from Macedonia to Persia and to India and Egypt and Iraq and whatnot. So, and some did, but in this case also you would see the Khalifa or the Caliph sitting behind, sending the forces and arranging, you know, even the battlefield uh, from Mecca and Medina. So let's see what else is there. Caliphate, this was a new philosophy of governance among Muslims or for any, you know, group of people over there. Caliph ruled through the shura. Very important. Shura is the council, you know, of counselors. So there would be leaders, wise people who would get together and advise the caliph. So it is sort of a, you know, advisory parliament, so to speak. You know, a group of people who advise the caliph how to rule. Caliph was he did not have any divine right to rule, just like, you know, so many other non-Muslim rulers claimed. He did not have the divine right to rule. He did not have to be hereditary ruler, but hereditary did creep in Muslim rule. But originally speaking, you know, no hereditary rule, no divine right to rule, okay? He had to rule with the people's support. If the people did not like him, he lost that legitimacy. And he was there only with the support of the people. And when the people did not support, you see, you know, then problems, okay? And some of these caliphs, they faced tough opposition. And some suffered persecution and even assassination. Keep in mind, uh, when we talk about uh, these, uh, you know, caliphs, the first four caliphs, highly dignified, respectable people, they were like uh, almost 24-7 with the prophet, very close to the prophet, and yet they faced all sort of opposition from Muslim and non-Muslims, and think about it. With the exception of the first caliph, Abu Bakr, the rest of the three that came after him, each one was assassinated. That tells you how much, you know, there was danger to Muslim and Islam and within Muslims also opposition. And we would see what that opposition would take Muslim and how that opposition would divide. It was not over, you know, what Islam was, but how Muslim had to be ruled. So it was a political question. Keep that also in mind. 
that divided the Muslims, it was not a religious question that divided the Muslims. So let us see what else we have. The selection or election of a caliph. So Muslims were divided in two groups at that time. The first group was the original local Muslims living in Medina. So these were the local Medina Muslims. These were the original uh, Muslims in Medina. Then Meccan Muslims came and settled with them as refugees. So in Medina, you have two types of groups, the local people and the Meccan refugees, Muslims who came and sought refuge in Medina. The first group of people are called Ansar, A-N-S-A-R, and the second group of people are called Muhajirin, M-U-H-A-J-I-R-I-N, Muhajirin, the refugees. The second group, they were divided into two groups. Group 2A, members of Muhammad's family or clan. So he brought his family, he brought his you know, relatives with him, settled in Medina along with him. So keep in mind, the house or the family of the Prophet was one group and one clan, very important. The 2B group was majority Quraysh, who came from Mecca and settled in Medina and they and there were other also other clans. So Quraysh were the Meccan people who came along with the Prophet at the time of the Hijrah. If you remember migration from Mecca to Medina that, that happened in 620 uh, AD. Okay. So now most of number one people they joined the 2B in making the important decision who to select as the next caliph. So keep that in mind, most of the majority of the people in number one, they joined 2B, that is the majority of the Quraysh people in deciding the question, you know, who to select or elect the next leader of the Muslims, the caliph, okay. Staying with the selection. So the majority of Muslim they selected or elected and we use these, you know, two words interchangeably because it had the selection as well as the election uh, procedure. Abu Bakr, they selected the majority of Muslim, selected Abu Bakr, who lived from 573 to 634 AD, okay, Abu Bakr. He was in fact the first adult male to convert to Islam, yes. So that was a great honor. And he was a staunch supporter of the Prophet. Okay, at a time when he needed every type of a support. Also, he was the father-in-law of the Prophet. Okay, he was father-in-law of Prophet Muhammad. He was a highly respected among, a person among Muslims for his very good nature character and his sacrifices for Islam. Highly revered, respected person among Muslims. Selection, election of the Caliph. Abu Bakr supported Muhammad وسلم, in his mission in early Islam and there you see him in this image, you know, uh, holding back this crowd who were going to stone the Prophet and, you know, uh, he was uh, beaten, the Prophet, he was injured, uh, he was gagged, you know, strangulated by some people and, you know, he, he would come and uh, rescue him, uh, save him from these uh, people because they did not like his message of Islam. So that happened in Mecca. Even in Kaaba, this is what happened, okay. Uh, majority of Muslims they selected, as I said, Abu Bakr, who was at that time age 60, known for, for, known for wisdom. As I said, he was the father-in-law of Muhammad. However, there was a minority group of Muslims who proposed another person, you know, and that was Ali at age 33 and he was known for bravery, valor. He was a you know, young man, 33 years, uh, you know, and very brave person, uh, Ali. And he was the son-in-law of Muhammad. So he, Ali was married to Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. So here you have the father-in-law and the son-in-law, a 60-year-old person and a 33-year-old person. 
So naturally, I don't know, you know. And uh, so you, you would see this again and again uh, in the history of Islam uh, that some people would, you know, pick one person and another people would pick another one. And that's how it happened soon after the death of the Prophet. Uh, just for a sort of a disclosure for this, uh, you know, and uh, maybe the future also. Uh, what I'm giving you here, the story is from the Sunni point of view, okay? And you would know this later on as we finish today's presentation and the next uh, three, four presentations. I'm giving you this perspective from the Sunni majority Muslim perspective, meaning that there is a minority Muslim perspective on this, and that is the Shia uh, minority group of people, and I have uh, a lot of friends among the Shia, and I have teachers who taught me, you know. Uh, so uh, I thought uh, it's, uh, you know, I should mention this disclosure that I'm giving you the Sunni, the majority Muslim perspective, okay? And uh, if there is any uh, Shia brother or sister or friend or, you know, a person who has problem with this presentation, I respect, you know, uh, his or her point of view, okay? But I, I, as I said, th there is a disclosure, you know, in place that uh, I'm giving you the Sunni and the majority Muslim perspective. And you, it, it would become clear the disclosure as we go further in the presentation and the three more that are coming. Okay, let's see what else. So staying with the election, selection of the prof, I mean the caliph. So here you see some Muslim proposed Ali as the first caliph because he is the son-in-law of Muhammad. And here you see uh, you know, in this uh, image, whether it happened or not, that's a different story. But here is the image. Uh, the prophet, he is placing his hand on the shoulder of Ali, sort of like, you know, blessing him and giving him his support, and he's giving him, you know, his uh, uh, sort of uh, permission, you know, for, for whatever that uh, occasion was. And he was sent, you know, on a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, tasks, uh, on a lot of uh, missions. So this image could be, you know, a sort of a representation of the prophet sending him of different tasks and missions, not necessarily telling him that when I die, you are going to succeed me. This is not acceptable to the vast majority of Muslim scholars. And till this day, if anybody claims like that, that is highly contested and disputed, okay? To the extent that it never happened. Okay, so having said that, let's move forward. Okay, so some Muslim proposed Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet, as to be the first caliph, but he did not get support of the majority of Muslims. So that should also be said and made clear. He did not get the support of majority of Muslims. Okay. And that divided, created a division, what is called the Shia Sunni political division among Muslims, and it created also sectarianism. So let's see what that means. The Sunni Shia or the Shia Sunni division 90% of Muslims, as we speak, are called Sunni. That is 90% of all the Muslims in the world. Okay? The vast majority of them are Sunni. And why they are called Sunni? Because they follow the Sunnah or the practice of the Prophet Muhammad okay? So Sunni is derived from the Sunnah, the practice of the Prophet. And so what they did, they elected or selected Abu Bakr as Caliph the first caliph, and his rule is called caliphate, okay? So the Muslim rulers, caliphs, their governance or their government is called, or rule is called caliphate. And so they use majority view in political matters. So majority decides according to the Sunni caliphate. The majority decides, you know, uh, what should be the, I mean, the outcome of the political problems. They also use Quran and Hadith, the Hadith books, to decide things. So these are the two main sources of the Sharia for uh, the Sunni Muslims, and, and was that to some extent for the Shia Muslim, as I will explain it. Okay, let's see. The ten percent of the Muslim are in the world they are called Shia. 
So, Shia are 10 percent, Sunnis are 90 percent and I will not you know be surprised if somebody says no the figure of the Shia is 20 percent and the Sunni is 80 percent. So, I used you know a safer bottom line uh, figure. And why they are called Shia? Because Shia means in Arabic Shia means partisan because they proposed Ali and they made the party of Ali that is why they are called Shia. Okay. And so, they accept Ali as Imam and so, the rule of the Imam is called Imamate. So, just as the Sunni have Caliphate, the Shia have Imamate. They follow members of the house of Muhammad, the messenger, the prophet and that house is called Ahlul Bayt, especially Ali's descendants from Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. Okay. So, they follow Ahlul Bayt the family of the Prophet through his daughter's marriage to Ali and they also use the Quran, but they only use those hadiths that come from the members of Muhammad's family, like Muhammad's family, his wife, Ali, his son-in-law and his uh, Ali's uh, wife Fatima and their two sons, Hassan and Hussein and their descendants. So, they would take hadith only from this limited group of people whereas Sunnis take hadith from every Muslim who was there around the Prophet, watched him, they stayed with him, were companions of him and so they were with him in Mecca and Medina and they were you know in peacetime and wartime everywhere with him and even you know uh, I mean there were a lot of people who were members of his family also. So, the Sunni use both the, in, the internal circle so to speak of Muhammad's you know first family and the external circles of friends and other people around Muhammad peace be upon him. So, the Sunni use a huge big uh, amount or number of the hadith, the Shia use you know a drastically less number of hadith or the sayings of the Prophet. So, let us see what else. Staying with that divide, that division among the Sunni and Shia as I said it started over a political leadership question. It was not who was going to be, what was going to be the Quran and hadith, no. Originally it started with a political problem and the problem was you know who was going to be the leader. So, it created two sectarian groups. This political question eventually became a pseudo religious division that we sometimes refer to it as sectarian division. The Sunni and Shia division and then they have you know their own subgroups not as drastically divided. They all believe that the Quran is the word of God that is the most important thing to bring Muslims together. That Quran is the word of God and both whether Shia or Sunni they use the same Quran, they translate it the same way and it is very important uh, for you to know that uh, some Sunnis and you are looking at one of them, okay, we love to listen to the Shia scholars. We have Sunni scholars who explain you know the Quran in a beautiful way, but it is always you know very interesting and very enlightening to listen to a Shia scholar. And the enlightenment comes in a way that you say my God he is saying exactly the same thing that I heard from the Sunni, from the Sunni scholar. So, why the difference and yet the difference is there. One is called Shia, the other is called Sunni. You know and so, that is why it, it is uh, the Quran is the one that brings Muslim together whether Sunni or Shia. They believe in the same Quran, not a single word is missing between the two of them. Yes, it is the same Quran, not a single word is missing and they interpret it 99.9 .9 percent the same way. Okay. So, there is no uh, I mean uh, difference of opinion when it comes to the Quran. It is the word of God and it is the same Quran that both use there could be a difference and that is the Arab, the Quran that is used in the Middle East is written mostly in the Arabic style. 
The Quran that we use back in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, and South Asia is mostly written in Persian style, Iranian style. It, same Arabic, but there is the, 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 slant, the slant difference, the difference of the slant, the way we write you know, uh, Arabic. Uh, we write it in Urdu and Pashto. We still use Arabic letters, Arabic language, but there is a little bit difference in the slant of the word but it is the same thing. I can read any stuff written by an Arab, and an Arab can read anything that I write in Arabic. But you would see uh, a little bit different, and it creates the beauty of calligraphy of the Islamic Quran, the holy book of Islam. When you write it in Arabic, that's one way to write beautiful. But when you write it in a Persianized Arabic style, so to speak, it also becomes very beautiful. And so uh, there is the uh, difference of the calligraphy, or rather the variety of the calligraphy that uh, Muslims use. And when something is written in Arabic in China, you would know that this was written by a Chinese. When something is written in Morocco, you would know that this was written in North Africa. You move to India and Pakistan, Afghanistan, and definitely you would know that this Arabic was written in South Asia. Okay, I think that's enough for now, and let's move further in the presentation. So what I wanted to emphasize that they both use the same Quran and they both believe that Quran is the word of God. But still, as I said, there are sectarian differences mostly over who is eligible to lead the Muslim people. Okay? So it's a matter of political leadership. Still staying with that divide. Sunni believe that any good Muslim can be a leader provided people support him. That is the majority of the Muslim uh, Sunni belief, Muslim Sunni belief. The Shia Muslim believe that no, only a descendant of Muhammad's daughter Fatima and her husband Ali can be a hereditary leader. So the Shia Muslim believe that only a person coming from or the descendant of Muhammad's daughter Fatima out of you know, her marriage with Ali, that could be, you know, he has the legitimacy to lead the Muslims. So that's the main big difference when it comes to the political division and the sectarian division on top of it or the consequent division between the Sunnis and the Shia. Okay. Shia Muslims, they follow hereditary rulers from, as I said, the Ahlul Bayt, Muhammad's family, which is Muhammad's daughter Fatima and her husband Ali. Okay. Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, and her husband Ali, who, who was Muhammad's cousin also, and their two sons, Hassan and Hussein, and then their descendants further down. Okay. Ali is Shia Muslims' first Imam. Yes, they believe in him as the first ruler for the Shia people first Imam, but he is the fourth Caliph of the Sunni Muslims. So there, there is that uh, difference how they treat Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet. For the Shia, he is the first Imam. For the Sunnis, he is the fourth Caliph. In both cases, he is a leader, no question about it. Okay, He is the leader but for the Shia, he is the first Imam, and for the Sunni, he is the fourth Caliph. But nonetheless, he is the leader. Another uh, difference would be that uh, Ali's family, you know, and his descendants, then they would be the next rulers for the Shia. And that Sunni Muslim do not accept. Sunni Muslim would rather elect or select their leader from whoever they believe was the right person for that job. And so that's the main difference between the two. Okay, let's move further. Abu Bakr, the first caliph that Muslims elected or selected, he ruled only for two years, from 632 to 634 AD. So the newly selected or elected caliph, he faced armed insurrections soon after the death of the prophet. Boy, he, he had to, you know, I mean, he went through a lot of stuff. He had faced, had to face armed insurrections. 
false prophets popped out everywhere. So you see, you know, every night somebody would say, hey, I'm the new prophet, believe in me. And so the Muslim had to go after him also. So some tribes, tribes they renounced Islam. Non-Muslim tribes in Northern Arabia also, they had to be dealt with. They became very emboldened soon after the death of the prophet and decided to attack Medina, the new republic of the prophet. So this brings me to uh, the point to make, and that is that at the death of the prophet, or by the end of his prophethood, so to speak, in the 23 years of his being the prophet, keep in mind, not all Arabs con converted to Islam. The prophet did not succeed in converting each and every Arab or each and every clan and family and tribe to Islam. However, by, the death, by his death in 632, he had succeeded to convert a lot and those who did not convert to live with them and coexist with them in peace. So if any tribe who did not convert to Islam, at least he was asked them, let us not fight. Do not attack us. We will not attack you. Do not attack any caravan. The traders or the merchants that go between Syria and Yemen, north and south. So as long as you stay in peace, you will enjoy peace. If you break the peace, then there would be war. And so in that type of a coexistence, of peaceful coexistence, he left a lot of tribes and clans and Arabs non-converted or left them as non-Muslims. Okay, with their original pagan beliefs. However, after his death, they believed that they could run over Medina and, you know, kill Islam, finish Islam, and kill all these Muslims because they had the strength. And so they believed that uh, if he is no more among them, he is dead. You know, this ideology would also be dead in few months or maybe years. So that is how they became very emboldened and wanted, and some did try to attack Medina. And that Abu Bakr, you know, more than 60 years old person had to deal with this. And he didn't have much time left. He had only two years. So in the last two years, he became the leader of the Muslim at a very critical and danger time in the history of Islam. So let's see uh, what he had to go through. So there. Non-Muslim tribes in Northern Arabia, they turned hostile, enemy, became enemies against Muslims in Medina, and they received support from the Byzantine Greek Christian Empire in the north. Okay, that's also a fact. And so this would create more trouble. When an empire supports a tribe to attack another tribe, that always creates problems. Okay? So there was an empire, Byzantine Greek Christian empire, you know, uh, involved in, this, uh, at, in these attacks upon the uh, Muslims and upon the Re Muslim Republic in Medina. Okay, let's see further. Muslim armies first attacked enemies or hostile uh, Bedouins because these Bedouins were closer and a greater threat to Medina. They lived in the near vicinity of Medina, they could easily, you know, overrun and overwhelm Medina and make it to collapse. So, Muslim decided to go after them first. So, their attacks could encourage also, the attacks of the Bedouins upon Medina could encourage other hostile tribes to attack Medina and that was, there was every likelihood of that, okay. Abu Bakr set rules for warfare before he believed that, uh, you know, his armies and uh, other allies, they go and fight against these different types of invaders and invasions, he had to set rules for warfare. And that he got from, some of them from the prophet. He told his people, observe loyalty, betray none, 
deceive none and steal from none because all these things would happen in warfare, you know, uh, among non-Muslims. So he telling Muslim, you are a different type of an army. Observe loyalty, betray nobody among the Muslims, deceive none and steal from none. Okay. Disfigure none of the killed enemies. That was also very much practiced among Arabs and non-Arabs at that time that they would, you know, disfigure their enemies that they killed in the battlefield. So he stopped them. If you might remember the battle of uh, Uhud, if you remember that, uh, the prophet's uh, uncle, he was disfigured when he was killed by, you know, the Quraysh Meccan enemies. He was disfigured, his nose and ears were cut, uh, and his uh, heart was open and his liver was, you know, taken out and it was chewed upon uh, by, uh, you know, a woman who hated Muslims and Islam and, and amazing. That woman, when she converted to Islam, the Prophet had to accept her too as a Muslim, you know, and her husband, the, the arch enemy of Islam, he also converted to Islam and he had to forgive them. And so, but this disfiguring of the, you know, killed enemy was very much in practice and the Prophet stopped it. Do not be like the non-Muslims. And so be Muslim, do not disfigure your enemy's face and do not disrespect his, the dead body. Do not disrespect the dead body. So uh, Abu Bakr had to repeat, you know, um, and say it again to the Muslim that he was going to send uh, in one campaign or another campaign. Let's see, uh, some other instructions. Do not kill any child, any woman, or any old person. Do not destroy trees or crops. So no policy of, you know, burn all. For the rules, do not slaughter cattle except for food. Whatever, if you need something to eat then, yes, but do not slaughter cattle of the enemy. Do not kill monks and hermits. These are religious people, very peaceful people. Do not hurt them, harm them, or kill them. Okay? After you conquer a territory, then what? Establish good government, good administration, and show the people the good side of Islam. Protect the people and respect their envoys. So this, this had to be done, and this was very important because, you know, I mean, throughout history, people have conquered places. And then they did horrible things to the people. And these people were at their mercy. So they did not show them any mercy. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he conquered Mecca, this was the place from where he had been driven out, persecuted. His friends had been persecuted and driven out of it. But when he conquered Mecca, when he went there, he told the Meccan people. And the Meccan people knew that uh, he, if he just slaughtered them, that would be you know, the right thing because that was the most common thing that people would do. And he said, no, today is not the day of revenge. Today is the day of peace and forgiveness. So he forgave these people. And that is the reason the vast majority of the Meccan people converted to Islam. He also gave them the choice. You can stay as you want. If you don't want to stay, we conquered you. But if you don't want to stay, you know, you can leave in peace and take whatever you want to take. You can take your family, your wealth, and, you know, land you cannot take, it had to be left behind. And so he told them, this is not the day of revenge, this is the day of peace and forgiveness. And this is, you know, what Abu Bakr had to tell his people uh, now after the, you know, the prophet was no more among them. Okay, let's see. So staying with Abu Bakr, Muslims armies, as I said, they first attacked rebel Bedouins living closer to the city of Medina. And there you see Mecca and Medina, but now the seat was in Medina. The capital was Medina. Mecca was the original place where it started, Islam started. But then Muslim, as you know, they immigrated to Medina and made it their capital. And so Medina was now under bombardment 
from the Bedouin tribes closer, living closer to Medina. So here the Muslims going after those tribes. And then Muslims' armies went in different directions to respond to the different th threats that are coming from different directions. So here what you see is, you know, mostly east and north and then west also. So that's how it worked. First, Muslim armies attacked those people, those enemies who were closer to Medina, to home, and then after subjugating them, then they went after those other people living mostly on the uh, western side of the uh, modern day Persian Gulf and especially Eastern Mediterranean, which would be modern day Palestine, uh, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, and Syria. And that we would see next time, but let's see what else we have in this presentation left. Okay. Expansion of Islam, and that's how it would happen. Okay. Different strategies that the Muslim adopted, the Caliph responded differently. Outright attacks on invading tribes, completely subjugated the defeated invaders who were living close to Medina, partial subjugation of the far away tribes, and he did not have the sources to completely subjugate them. Okay. So he had to offer them you know, terms and conditions, tribute and good conduct. Pay us annually so much money, cattle, could be horses, you know, uh, camels, and you have to be peaceful. Good conduct was always the condition of the Muslim rulers to the non-Muslims, especially in the beginning of Islam. And also, you give safe passage to other people and you receive receive safe passage from other people. So protection and peace and safe passage for trade and business communication, you know, that had to be ensured with the far off tribes. Okay. He, this policy created different results. The complete Islamization of tribes living closer to Mecca and Medina, okay, and the partial Islamization of people living outside of Arabian Peninsula, and it makes sense, okay? He could easily teach people living closer to Mecca and Medina, this is what true Islam is. You know, he could send them more people, but to the far off places, he could not do that. And so, in the far off places, Islam was not a complete religion of the people. So rise of sectarianism in the Persian Gulf and beyond, that had to happen naturally because of the distance, you know, the geographical distance and so many things that uh, went, you know, I mean, far off places. These were different cultures, non-Arab, you know, and they had different histories and different developments and different mode of economies. Some would adopt complete Islam and some wouldn't. But as time went, Islam became more and more universal among the, f even among the far off places. But keep in mind, the differences still remained. Linguistic differences, historical differences, economic differences, even if the religion became very universal, still these differences were there and would have some consequences for the history of Islam and Muslims. Let's see further. Going against empires, Muslim conquest of the Arab tribes, northwestern Arabia, in the northwestern Arabia like Syria and Egypt, northeastern Arabia like Iran and Iraq, brought caliphate in conflict okay, with two superpower empires, the Greek Byzantine Christian Empire in the north, and the Persian Sassanid Zoroastrian Empire in the east. So these were the two superpowers at that time, and these conquest of the Arabian Peninsula brought the, the caliphate, you know, in conflict with these two great empires. Okay. Byzantine Empire versus the Sassanid Empire. These were the Greeks, Christians, and versus Persian Zoroastrian who had been fighting, you know, continuously, nonstop from 500 years before Jesus to 600 years after Jesus. So they had been fighting among them, 
you know, before. The Persians, they destroyed Acropolis in 480 BC. That was the most sacred place of the Greeks and the Persian destroyed it, 480 BC. Then Alexander, the Greek, the Macedonian, he burnt the capital of the Persian people, the Persepolis, in 330 BC before Christ. So as you know, there were problems and fighting and killing and massacres between the Greeks and the Persian before the rise of Islam. So Arabs, Turks, Syrians, these guys were caught between the Greeks and the Persians. Okay? And that would make Islam very prosperous and very acceptable to the Arabs and the Turks and the Syrian and other people because they would look at Islam, uh, saving them and freeing them from these two great empires who had been, you know, making them to fight for them, uh, taxing them, recruiting them by force, that is, uh, drafting them in their army. So when the Arab came and saved these people from these two superpowers, Boy, that was a great achievement on part of the Muslim Arabs that gave peace to those people who were caught between the two great empires. Okay, let's see further. And so there you see the burning of Persepolis and then the avenging of Acropolis, as I you know, said in the previous uh, slide. And so there, you know, the two burning and avenging and the destruction of you know, uh, each other's uh, sacred places, so to speak. And so let's see uh, you know, how that happened. In fact, the Persians were the first you know, to attack the Greeks, and they ruled the Greeks for some time. And so let's see how, yeah, there, the Persians going west you know, against the Greeks, and then the Greeks later on in the time of Alexander would go against the Persians right there and burn Persepolis. However, 1,000 years later, so to speak, the Arabs, starting out of Mecca and Medina, going against both these uh, great uh, you know, powers and destroyed both of them and freed so many people that were caught between these two superpowers. Uh, we will talk about this next time when we come to how the Arabs had to deal, the new Muslim you know, empire had to deal with the two previous super, you know, empires. So let's see, I think uh, a reaction paper is coming at you, <laughs> the right there, reaction report. And so there you write a note on the challenges that arose from the death of, the, of Prophet Muhammad and how, you know, uh, Abu Bakr and Muslim had to face them. So it's a one point, uh, you know, report, uh, just write a note on the challenges that arose from the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's see what we did in review. Well, we talked a lot about the selection of Caliph Abu Bakr. In fact, before that, we talked about the challenges, you know, that uh, the Muslim had to face soon after the death of the Prophet. So the selection and election of Abu Bakr and how then they defeated insurrections against Islam and how Islam, you know, they expanded the Islamic rule to the borders of Byzantine and Persian Empire, and that we will talk more about in the next uh, uh, session, session 15. Okay, so uh, what you should do is stay engaged. Uh, any question, any comments, please let me know through Lima. Always check your assignments, you know, and send me messages, and thank you very much, and uh, we we'll see you next time in session 15. Aloha. <laughs>